Welcome to Hobilum. We are excited that you've decided to join us today. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We get to rejoice and be glad in it. There is a powerful message that's coming your way. We look forward to the message that God has prepared. This is a rhema word coming just for you. We ask you that you would subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can make sure you have access. So please get ready for a powerful opportunity for God to speak directly to your heart. Uh, good morning, friends. It's good to be with you this morning. My name is Ryan Kalasar. Uh, my family and I have been going here for a little while. I've had the opportunity to, and the, the honor to bring God's word uh, several times here, and today being one of them. And so just good to be with you, especially if it's your first time. And for those friends that are joining us online, we're so grateful that you're chiming in, tuning in. If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 12, if you haven't done that, grab that there. We are wrapping up the series, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective Christians. And uh, we took a break just to get our our 24-7 blueprint mandate, if you will. And uh, that's, that's who we are, what we're heading into. And so I get to wrap up this piece, and, it, and there is a tie-in with it, and we're going to get to that in just a bit, but uh, we're going to ask the Lord to open up our hearts even further. So Lord Jesus, come and do what you need to do on us, so that you can do what you need to do through us. Lord, this word is heavy. This word is heavy not only for me personally, but sense that there are those here that this word is going to be heavy for them. And and as Paul unravels this for us, we try to make sense of it. May we know that we come to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, I'm going to be preaching and, and, and hear this. Preaching no longer out of wounds, but out of scars. Let me say this again. I'm going to be preaching out no longer with wounds, but scars. And there's a difference. Some of you come in here this morning, and you got open wounds. You got open wounds that are, are, have been happening, transpiring, things that have happened a long time ago, or things that have just happened. And the trouble with when you try to minister or speak out of wounds or even just live life out of wounds, it's a vulnerable place, isn't it? Even worse so, you start spilling out on everybody else, don't you? Right? Start bleeding on them. It becomes trauma. It becomes triage. It becomes all these things. And nobody wants to see that. But that's the reality of what happens. But God... But God has a promise for you. And the promise for you this morning is that those wounds can be healed. Those wounds can become scars. Those wounds can be in a place that no longer is spilling out, but becomes the source, becomes the pivot, becomes the place that you are able to speak out of. And be able to to do what God wants to do. It wasn't very long after, I'm talking weeks, perhaps a couple months, my family and I moved to a call down south, and we were living in Minnesota. And this call uh, was to be a pastor, uh, an associate pastor, outreach pastor kind of thing, partnering with another pastor down. And we, we got everything up. So at that time, it was my wife and my two little girls and they were little at the time. One of my babies just read right now. <laughs> and she ain't little anymore. You know? uh, it's so good to see that. Oh, blesses my heart. So we move, get down there to this call. And what ends up happening, I kid you not, within the next few weeks to months, I was told how much I wasn't welcome. It became very evident, and, and, and the thing is, nobody actually said anything that was of the nature, but it was what I could read and what I could tell and how, how things were happening from, 
from another source or, or, or anybody else that you're able to see and you can feel it. And I wasn't welcome. And in fact, you know, in my mind, I kept seeing pitchforks and, and, and uh, torches ready to get me out of there. These are supposed to be my brothers and sisters. These are supposed to be the ones that I'm partnering with to do ministry. These are the ones that I, I've been called alongside to proclaim the gospel, to reach out. And several of them are the ones that want me out and gone. And I don't know why. Fast forward, a little after almost five years, we get to Des Moines. And within about a month, I receive an email. And in this email, the, 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 one of the persons who, who, who was kind of part of the undercurrent reached out and said, yes, these things were happening. Confirmed finally confirmed that these attitudes and these behaviors and everything that was coming against was true. I wasn't dreaming. I wasn't, I wasn't having, and if anything, it was more of a nightmare, but it was true. And then they had the audacity to ask for forgiveness. What would you do? What would you do if you knew that there were families and people that were coming against you specifically? And it wasn't just neighbors. It was people within the church. They're coming against you in all kinds of ways, right? They want you out. They want you gone no longer, telling you you don't belong here. Then they ask you for forgiveness. What are you going to do? Forgive them, sure. Easier said than done. Isn't that the truth? Maybe it's somebody you barely know. And, and we find ourselves in the midst of conflict all over the You barely know. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's a neighbor. Friends, maybe it'd be it's somebody here, a brother and sister, who's part of this body of believers intentionally pursuing you to hurt you. Intentionally coming against you to hurt you. What are you going to do? What would you do? Right, and, and sometimes it's the awkward moments. It's the you may you see them from a distance, and you try to find every way to avoid walking into their path, walking into the same room. Maybe it's at the grocery store. You know, it's like don't make eye contact. Don't make eye contact. Ah, crap! I just made eye contact. What do I do? You know that awkward moment. What do you do? Supposed to be on the same team. We proclaim the same Jesus on that cross. They've wronged you, probably willfully. And as we look at the text, it's it's a willful, wrongful hurt. What do we do? Well, Paul sets the stage, and part of this title or subtitle is overcoming evil with good. Not saying that those people are evil, but they're definitely evil intentions. And Paul sets the stage for the rest of these verses, right? The rest of these verses that we just heard read, Paul sets the stage in chapter 12, verse 2, that Ryan Tunick had preached on several weeks back. And it's the foundational habit for us to be able to do this. And what is that foundational habit? Well, it's summed up in this, Romans 12, 2, and also pulling in 9 through 10. Only the transformed life has the capacity to love through action. Paul sets the stage for you to be able to absolutely be able to do these seven habits. This is the first habit. And if we don't lock this one down, that only the transformed life has the capacity to love in action, we cannot love in action. We cannot live out what it is that we're called to do. And, and, and just before Paul gets to this point, what does he say? Offer yourselves up. In order for you to let go, you got to give up something. In order for you to live out something, you got to let it go, right? You have to offer, and, and, and unfortunately, as much as it hurts, you got to offer your whole self. Can't be bits and pieces. So Paul sets it up, and he's using this metaphor of transformation to describe the discipleship process, right? In order for us to actually look like Christians, we got to act like Christians, right? We can't just say that we are 
Christians, we have to actually do it, and we cannot, will not do it unless we're transformed. So Paul sets the stage. So this is the first, and we're going to go through six more habits. Six more habits that's going to cause us to, to, to wrestle with some stuff this morning. And this is going to get heavy. And kids, if you're in here, I'm sorry that this is, is heavy, but for some reason, God likes to give me heavy things. <laughs> it's going to get real. But let's do it together. Paul sets the stage, and he's talking to the Rome, the Roman Christians, right? The Roman Christians, and as he's doing that, he is, he is lining it up within the context of persecution, if you look at this painting that is depicted, the Christian martyr's last prayer by Jean Leon, right? And, and in this, this painting, this was the scene that our brothers and sisters of the early church were dealing with. If you were a Christian caught, you were sent to persecution, and you were sent within the arena where the lions, the tigers, and the bears, oh my, came after you. The challenge that they would have, and, and then what, what, what this depiction is, is that this is my last stand and call because I know there is impending death coming. There's impending death. And, and persecution is definitely that. But we talk about persecution today because, uh, well, we don't have a context for it. We think about, most of us think about persecution as somebody's not being nice to us. They made fun of us, right? Or, or you're having this exchange on social media. They're persecuting you. Friends, that's not persecution. Persecution is that when somebody's sword is upon your neck and the next thing you remember is nothing. Persecution is where our brothers and sisters across the globe are actually losing their lives. They're actually having their villages burned down. They're having everything come against them. That is true persecution. However, Paul is using a word with persecution that is not just that, but it's somebody that is pursuing you to harm you. That is a context we can hit. Right? That is a context we can understand. They are intentionally pursuing you to hurt you. How are they trying to hurt you? Well, they're trying to bring you down in every way and shape that they can. And, and so Paul is using this to think out this idea that there are some people that, even within the body of Christ, want to hurt you willingly. Well, isn't the truth that hurt people hurt people? Or am I the only one? <laughs> so what does Paul say? Paul says this, habit number two, out of the transformed life, respond with blessing. Respond with blessing. Bless those who persecute you. Bless them and do not curse them. <laughs> Easier said than done, Paul. Easier said than done, persecutor of persecutors. Paul was the guy who went after every Christian that he could possibly do. In the name of God... Right? He went after Christians thinking, you know what, I'm doing God's will by actually causing harm to these people that are professing this risen Jesus. Paul is evil incarnate until he gets transformed, right? And in fact, Paul gets knocked off a donkey onto his bottom. And then there is something that happens between that moment and when the scales come off, that there is a transformation that happens. And in that transformed life, he says, you know what? We respond with blessing. We, in fact, we resolve, which means within here, I'm resolving, I'm taking a stand to bring good, not harm. Paul, who wants to bring harm, not good, is actually saying the opposite now because radical love chooses to bless, not to curse. It's counterintuitive, and he's had a counterintuitive cultural realization that the God he has been proclaiming is not the fullness of, it's Jesus. He has a transformed life. And, and so he starts to bless. So how do we bless somebody? Well, it's, it's not, I'm going to pray for you and then leave. 
It's, I'm going to pray for you, right? I think Ryan did something like this. <laughs> I'm going to pray for you, right? No, it's truly praying for them. And in fact, when it's something that comes against you that hurts, we do the opposite to it. They call you ugly, you tell them they're pretty. They say you, whatever that word is that's lingering over you right now. The blessing comes with the opposite. So Paul says, bless those. And then he has the audacity to say this. So not only bless them, but you know what? We are going to say, rejoice and weep with them. Paul, you're crazy. (laughs) He wants me to rejoice and weep. So the persons that are actually coming against me, pursuing to harm me, He wants me to rejoice when they're rejoicing, and then he says, weep with them when they're weeping. He's saying, celebrate with them, even though you may not be part of that, and then he says, empathize with them when they need that the most. That is not a response that somebody should have, is it? At least according to the world. That is not a response that The world has, but yet, Paul is saying, because of the transformed life, we show concern for their gains and their losses. We we show concern because you know why? The transformed life, verse 2, is a life that is able to love genuinely, abhor what is evil, because it's the concrete indication that you really do have love within you. That person that wants nothing but harm for you and you start to celebrate with them or even deeper yet, you put your arm around them when they don't want your arm other than to cut it off probably. This is not This is not a normal response. Paul then says, this sets up that we rejoice. What it sets up is now that we can live in harmony with one another. And and then he says this, don't be haughty, but associate with the lonely. Never be wise in your own sight. If I am to bless and then to rejoice, now you want me to react with harmony and humility. Verse three says, don't allow yourself to think you are better. And and what we tend to do in, in the world is we set up this hierarchy, right? That somehow because somebody hurts me, I'm going to push their needs down further, right? Especially in that case. We want to put their needs, we want to put what they're feeling down, and somehow we elevate ourselves and who we are above them. Paul's saying no. In fact, Paul says this earlier in 1 Corinthians. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not to reduce the nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. What's Paul saying there? He's saying that we're gonna level the playing field. We're gonna level it down. And in fact, what we're gonna do is respond in such a way that it causes somebody to pause and say, what? What? We'll get into it a little bit further as to what that will cause. But Paul is setting this up that the reaction of humility, well, C.S. Lewis says this about humility. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but it's thinking of yourself less. C.S. Lewis, this philosopher, theologian, this author in the 19th century, 20th century, just an amazing person, thinker, atheist to believer, It's not saying that I'm going to degrade myself, that somehow I'm a horrible human being. What he's saying is that I'm actually going to think of somebody more than I think about myself. 
And that's what humility does. And humility flips the script. It turns things around, right? It turns it on its head. And, and that is how we're able to bring in this harmony with somebody when our humility is leading. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Well, there's a challenge that comes with that, isn't there? He says this, out of that, repay no evil, no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far it depends on you live peaceably with all. So this humility sets up, right, further, further within that, that we are able to not repay evil with evil. Instead, we repay evil with good through the practice of peace. Now, this is not peace like, dude, right? This is a peace, as Jed was alluding to, this peace that surpasses understanding, this peace that brings a calm to storms, this peace that is able to, to bring a calm to the chaos within my life, this peace that is able to settle the conflict that's going on, this tension, right? But in order to do this, we do not allow others' evil actions to determine our response. Because when they have a hold of you, they are the puppet master. And they know every button to push. And they know everything that they can to do to make your life miserable. We don't allow them to do that. They don't own us. They don't own anything within us. We are Jesus. We are Jesus's, and they have no place for that. So because of that, we're able to maintain an atmosphere of peace. We're able to, to bring about as so much as it depends on you. Now, there is a point where you can only do so much, but you do everything that you can up to that point. Because peace, well, Jesus kind of gives us a twist to this, and he kind of sets the stage. But here's the question. How much more effort would we put into peacemaking, blessed are the peacemakers, if we saw things for God's, from God's perspective rather than our own? Rather than repaying the evil with evil, right? It's the idea of, God, what's your perspective and how would you rather me be able to respond in this situation? And if the peace of God lives within you, the peace of God will go before you. As far as it depends. We are responsible for being peacemakers until we can't be peacemakers anymore. Then it's not you, it's them. But you do everything within your effort. How much more would it be if we actually looked through God's lens, God's lens instead? Thomas Merton, a theologian, a monk, wasn't a big fan of wars, had something to say about this. Think of this not in the time of war, but the chaos within. Instead of hating the people you think are war makers that come against you, that, that have and want to create chaos within your life. Hate the appetites and disorders in your own soul, which are the causes of the war. Hate the thing within you that wants to respond, that wants to push back, that wants to fight. Hate the thing within you that wants to bring harm to them. If you love peace, then hate injustice, hate tyranny, hate greed, but hate these things in yourself, not in the other person. Hate that thing within them that's causing the grief, the harm, the chaos. Hate the thing within them that is coming to that. Whether it be the flesh, whether it be the world's influence, Ephesians 2 or the last piece, a doggone devil. Hate those things that come against peace, not the person you are trying to make peace with. 
So Paul, you want me to live with peace. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with others. But then he goes on and he uses this word beloved. Beloved. It's an endearing word. It's a word that draws in. We love a good vengeance story, don't we? Oh, come on. Taken, right? Liam Neeson. Or, 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 or for uh, the comic book geeks in here, Batman. Batman went through some injustice. His parents are murdered and killed, and he becomes vengeance incarnate. In fact, he responds, if you've seen the movie, The Batman, he, who, he's asked who he is. He doesn't just say, I'm Batman. He says, I am vengeance. Liam Neeson, his character Brian, right, ends up having his daughter taken to be brought into trafficking. And, 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 and he's on the phone, I don't know who you are, right? I mean, it's, I will find you. <laughs> we love it when we see good guys seek out justice and vengeance. We want to be part of that story. We want to be able to, to step in there. But Paul uses this. He says, beloved, as much as you want to be able to do that. Let, let me even say it this way. I'm a dad of three kids, right? Any, any parents in here or anyone that has little ones within their family, and they know, and they're out on the playground, and you see these bullies that come up, and, and they're ready to pick a fight. Everything is off the table at that point, right? You, as a, as a parent, your fingers, your knuckles are t tensed up. You're ready. I don't care if you're an eight-year-old kid. I'm going to knock some sense into you, and then I'm going to take your dad on too, right? I mean, that's the idea that comes with it. I will bring revenge, right? I will seek justice. I'm going to give you a whooping. That your daddy should have given you a long time ago. Isn't that the case? We want to do that. We want to be vengeance incarnate. But Paul says this, beloved, this term of endearment, never avenge yourselves. Believe it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay it, says the Lord. Paul is saying, relegate vengeance, push it down, put it aside, get, it, get rid of it, get rid of the idea, because let God worry about repaying evil, not Batman. Paul sets it up. In order for us to, in verse 14, to abhor what is evil, we have to be able to get rid of this need for vengeance. To, to make it, it doesn't matter if, they, if you're right in the situation. It doesn't matter that they are completely wrong. What is Paul saying? He's saying that in order to live out the transformed life, you have to be able to push vengeance aside and leave it to God. He says, beloved, is speaking to a to children, beloved, this term of endearment, beloved, part of the beloved community, part of this community of believers, part of those who follow Jesus, beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to God. He goes one step further. thinking through the lens of this vengeance piece. Leave it to God. Leave it to God. Let God be the one that repays. Let God be the one because he says vengeance in mind. Friends, let me ask you this question. When we think about vengeance, we need to be able to look to the cross. Okay? Because if there was ever a time, a just time for God to take vengeance, it would be at Calvary. Would it not be at Calvary? If there was ever a time, ever a moment in time for God to administer vengeance, it would be at the crucifixion of his innocent son. This man who was wrongfully accused, unjustly brought to a trial that was illegal, who was spat on, beat up, all the things including murder, 
If there was ever a time for God to rain down hellfire, brimstone, wrath, that would have been the time, right? That would have been the daddy moment. Okay, the gloves are off. I'm coming down. But he didn't. Yet, he didn't because this is the pinnacle of vengeance for sin. This is the, 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 the pinnacle for vengeance for sin. God taking on God's punishment. God taking on God's wrath. God taking on God's justice. Everything that we have within our sinful nature, God is taking it on and he's taking vengeance upon it. It just so happens that God did not send his son to take that on. Jesus said, I'll take it. I'll take it. I'm innocent, but I'll take it because we can't. We can't take on God's wrath and vengeance. So he does it for us to the point where he's murdered. But God, but God, but God, but God buries that vengeance, <laughs> buries it. Nobody's going to be able to put it back up and creates a place for us to celebrate creates a, a moment for us to celebrate God's justice because we could not take it on. His justice is carried out on the cross and we can celebrate. Why? Because Jesus said, I put it behind us. I'm walking out a new... I'm walking out with a new thing. I'm walking out with a new, new, new look on life for you. So vengeance is here. So Paul says, never avenge. Then he goes on and he says, to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So this first part, it says to the contrary. Paul is not contradicting his, per, uh, his previous statement then leave it to God, and then on the contrary, do this. He's saying because we leave it to God, we can, to the contrary, feed those that are in need, especially if they're coming against us. Give them something to drink. Clothe them. Why? Because we give our enemies what they need, not what they deserve. We know that they deserve something. We want to justify everything. They give that, right? But we give them what they need. So because we leave vengeance to God and God alone, we can now rend heaven, open heaven up by our actions as believers that becomes a means of God's punishment. Now, here's what I mean by that. And Paul using the entire, the, the, the concept of coal, okay? Because we leave vengeance out there, we heap coal. This idea of bringing punishment. Now, it's not punishment where it's hellfire and brimstone, all of a sudden it's like, you know, this, this twisted way of, of punishment coming onto this person, right? That, that it's like wrath coming around. It's not what that is. It's by saying this, picture this. I got a fire in my heart. I got, I got, I got, I got this fire. I got something good cooking on here. Something that's going to feed my family. I, I, I got a heat within my house. I got warmth. I got the, the ability to see within here. And my neighbor, my neighbor doesn't have a fire. Doesn't even have the capacity to start a fire. Doesn't have the capacity to, to, to cook a meal. And his family is starving and they need something. They're looking around. But I know that my neighbor has been just a terrible neighbor. Awful human beings. So God, what do I do? Open heaven. I take that coal that's been, it's been glowing, smoldering. I put it on a means to carry it over. I carry it over to them. 
And I say, you know what? I see that you're without. I see that you're in need. And put that coal there. I'm going to put that coal there. And, and you know what? You do with it whichever you need. You do with it whatever you need at that moment. Now, if I was this person over here, I would be looking at that person saying, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? I've been the worst person to you that could possibly be. And you're going over here bringing not just that coal, but now that coal is starting to, to touch all these, these cold coals, and, and they're starting to warm up. And pretty soon there's a fire that's going to be coming in there. But you know how the fire gets there? How does the fire get there? we got to blow on it. <sighs> that fresh wind. we got to bring in that fresh wind. So when the open heaven comes in, that you brought that open, God's Punishment is not to bring wrath. God's punishment is to say, look how your neighbor treats you. What, what does your neighbor have that you don't have? And that neighbor starts asking, what does that person have that I don't have? I want that. And all of a sudden, the wind of that Holy Spirit starts moving around. The wind starts coming around, and it brings in that oxygen. It brings in life to death, and it starts to open up that fire, doesn't it? And all of a sudden, that person who is without, that's his need, they got the capacity, right, to not only have a fire glowing, they have light, they have heat, they have a, the capability of making food. Isn't that what a lighthouse is supposed to do for us? Isn't that what it's supposed to be? Isn't that what the idea is, is that we bring that coal because there are so many people out there that don't have the capacity to start the fire because we are started. We are the fire starters. We get to start it because God lit us up. <laughs> and now we are rending heaven open. That open heaven on that person. What do you think is going to happen with that person? Who else needs some fire? Isn't that the thing? That is what Paul is saying in my really long roundabout way. Paul is saying is that when you do that, when you bring this to them, it is souls coming on fire. It is souls coming to life. It's souls that are coming to know Jesus. It's souls that are saying, you know what? There is a God because that person doesn't have the capacity to do anything else, but it must have been God. And then they find somebody else. This is about eternity, friends. This is about eternity. This is about living out the life God has called us to live. We heap coals on unbelievers especially, but you know what? If they are friends, if they are believers, if they are brothers and sisters, we heap coals on them because, let's face it, maybe their fire is out. Maybe they're just more of smoldering and they need something hotter in there. We bring coals. Because Paul says this, isn't it the kindness of the Lord that leads us to repentance? Isn't it the kindness of God who should have brought wrath upon us? His kindness that tells me, you know what? I'm about facing, I need to serve, I need to run after you, I need to serve, I need to go after you. And isn't it that kindness that you bring, the Lord's kindness that you bring to your neighbor that starts asking the question, what? Do you have that I want? We rend heaven, we open it up, and we create this, this push to reduce evil. A fresh wind. A new fire. So let me go back to the story. We're sitting here, I'm sitting here in, <clears throat> in Des Moines, looking at this computer screen with this story, th th this admission of guilt. Will you forgive me? No. I don't want to forgive you. I don't want to forgive you for the things you did to me, the things that you did to my family, the things that you did to this congregation that we were part of. I don't want to forgive you. 
Isn't that what our heart says? But the Lord in that moment reminded me that I am a transformed follower of my Lord. And because I'm transformed, regardless of my wounds, I closed my eyes and I just started typing like this. <laughs> and through the power of interpretation, it said, I forgive you. I was able to forgive that person in that moment. Now, here's the thing I want you to know. Just because you say you forgive doesn't mean you forget. And especially when you have wounds, it took me three years of therapy. It took me another couple years of working this stuff out, meeting with brothers and sisters, going through the process. And that's why I can say, I am no longer preaching out of wounds, friends. I'm preaching out of a scar. That's right. That scar, but it took work. It took work to be able to get to that point. And friends, I'm going to tell you this this morning. There are some of you here. It's time for you to unload. It's time for you to back the truck up and dump out everything that's been causing you harm, grief, holding on to things that are just terrible. It isn't the thing is, is that when we say we forgive, we still go on cursing because we haven't let it go. And in fact, what we tend to do, what this is what forgiveness is, that we have to come up to that cross and say, Jesus, this person owes me everything. This person owes me everything. I want them to feel everything I feel, if not more. But I can't receive forgiveness if I don't let it go. I can't give forgiveness if I don't let it go. When we say they owe me, we're seeking vengeance. When we say, Lord, have it, He's got it. If we seek to prevent triumph of evil and persecution within our lives, we must resist the urge to handle things ourselves and leave them to God. Friends, will you commit to living out this radical love? Will you commit to living this radical love in your daily life? Are you going to reflect Jesus in the way when the world is watching that looks like this instead of what they have? And I leave you with this. We don't have time to be carrying around a dump truck full of hurt. I'm not saying that the hurt isn't real. It's real. But we don't have time. There are too many souls at stake here. There are too many people that need to know Jesus in this community. And friends, in this particular house of God, we do not have time to constantly be coming up against everything that somebody hurts us with and not moving into that place of forgiveness and moving so that God can take care of them instead of us. And we can actually bring the message of who Jesus is, be that light where we need to be in this neighborhood in the places of your work, in their neighborhoods, in wherever it is that God has placed you. We don't have time to be sitting in a dump truck. <laughs> For those of you that have wounds this morning, the altar is open. The altar is here. There are prayer warriors here that are willing to come with you if you feel something palpitating within your heart, you feeling that pressure within there, God is speaking to you right now, this moment. The Holy Spirit is moving within your life. Come and take advantage of it because, friends, I'm telling you, I, I'm coming out of scars because I was able to come and lay it down. Come and lay it down. 
Because we got a God who's willing to take it for you. We have a God who is, he's got good news. And this is your jubilee. Will you please rise? <clears throat> Father in heaven, you've been working on people here, my brothers and sisters here all morning, all week, and there is an opportunity here for them to come and lay it down. There is an opportunity for them to come and put all their burdens here. There is an opportunity for them to hear that there is a God who is taking it. And then there is here to hear the promise that this is their jubilee, their liberation, their freedom from that which has been holding them back, that which has been holding them down, that which has been hold, weighing them down. And the opportunity is here for them to receive grace. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. Everything we need, God's got it. If you need prayer, if you need anything, please reach out, make certain that you follow up. We hope that you enjoyed that powerful message. See you next time.